that's a that's a, a favorite hymn of mine. Although I have to tell you, when I I first sang it as a student at Asbury College, I thought that uh, third verse was going a little far, talking about us being sundials and uh, how he's going to mark us as a sundial. But the more uh, the more I I have contemplated that verse over the years, that we may trust him fully, and they who trust him wholly find him wholly true. I think uh, I think our our moments of light are marked by the Son of Righteousness that has risen with healing in its wings. I'm going to give credit where I once thought there might have been something superficial because our time is a gift from Him. and He's redeeming that time, but in time He's redeeming you and me. So I think there is a mark upon us that our time is in His hands, our days in His hands, and that we're to live in that light. So the writer uh, in the Old Testament said, so teach us, Lord, to number our days. And uh, I want to see today in your life and in my life, in these moments, the very thumbprint of Christ as he impresses you and impresses me in these moments of time. And it's no better time than to have two witnesses that have come through Wesley Biblical Seminary and given their, their gifts and graces to us and We've given our gifts and graces to them and to allow them to share what's on their heart in mission. So Patrick and Rachel, the rest of the chapel hour is yours and uh, may the Lord be with you as you share with us. Well, thank you, Dr. Smith and and so many others um, that are part of the Wesley Biblical family. Um, those of you that I haven't met and those of you that, uh, that, um, that I had the privilege of, of meeting um, about a year ago, I guess I was. It is a great privilege to be here among you, um, now married to, to Rachel, who was here before. Um, it's a wonderful thing and a wonderful journey that the Lord has called us on. Pray with me. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your goodness to us. Thank you for your great faithfulness. Lord, would you um, have my words and Rachel's words? Um, as we come before uh, this body and uh, and praise you and uh, tell of your glory, tell of your goodness and what you've done, would you um, impress uh, impress upon our hearts um, the message you would have for us today? Amen. Amen. <laughs> well, a few years ago, I took the plunge, contemplating what the Lord had done in my life, what the Lord was doing in other people's lives. Um, <clears throat> the needs that were around me. I said, okay, Lord, I will. I will take that step of faith and go wherever you lead me. And the Lord said, good, wonderful, let's go. I'll take you on an incredible journey and I'll, um, it'll be a refining journey. It'll be a good journey. It'll be uh, a journey of blessing and of, uh, and of comfort in the midst of pain and it will be an incredible journey um, of love and of learning uh, that I'm calling you on. And uh, as Rachel and I talk this morning, just for a few moments, um, have that question in your mind. Um, what is the Lord impressing upon me? Why am I here? Um, what role do I have to play in the great story that began at creation and that ends at the great wedding feast? I want to share with you a little bit about the vision of something called Extreme Walk. Now, when I was here before, um, the main things that I was concentrating on were studies, um, pursuing Rachel, and uh, <laughs> and coordinating Extreme Walk. That's <laughs> and some would say oh, yeah, oh, that wasn't in the correct order, right? Um, let me tell you a little bit about the program that I was uh, involved in. I started in 2003. I went um, to go on an extreme walk. And then I was called to be a, a group leader in extreme walk. And then I was um, asked to be the extreme walk coordinator, the international coordinator for this program, which is a program of OMS International, um, a mission that, that many of us know. Extreme walk is a 10-month church planning internship. It's, a, um, it's an experience of complete submersion into a, a new culture 
many times a new language, to go and learn how to make disciples in the context of a church, of planning a new church that multiplies, Lord willing, um, learning all of that <laughs> from indigenous leadership. So there are missionaries, usually from the, a similar culture of the young missionaries that's going. There are other missionaries on this field. Um, for instance, I went to Ecuador. There are already OMS missionaries on the field who received me, who gave me a place to stay for a few days. But they promptly sent me on down about an hour away so I could stay in South Quito in a neighborhood where there was an indigenous church planning team planning a church. They had done that for four months before me, so I got to, I got to see a church go from um, about five members, three of which were the church planning team, of which I was one, um, uh, go from that house church to a, uh, a fully functioning um, baptizing and giving communion and teaching and making disciples body of believers. Meeting, uh, meeting in a rented building. Um, if you count on all the kids, it was about 80, just to give you an idea of, 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 of the changes of life that happened while I was there that I got to witness. But I can't really come here and tell you about a program and not tell you about the, the principles that it has. I'd like to share with you... Um, life experiences, of course, and what's been going on in my life, and I will. But right now, go with me to Luke 9. And as we read this, we can ask ourselves, um, what about discipleship? How, is disi- how are disciples being formed here? Who's discipling who, and what disciples are, are being made? Well, actually, forgive me. I'll focus on Luke 10, but let's uh, let's go back to Luke 9 and just uh, remember that Jesus sent out the 12, um, calls them together, gave them power and authority to cast out demons and heal all diseases, then went them ahead of him to, um, to uh, towns and villages. Then some other things happen that are really stressful. Um, ups and downs. Herod kills John the Baptist. We have the feeding of the 5,000 again. Not again, but we have the feeding of the 5,000. Um, then, uh, then Peter realizes, uh, receives from the Lord that Jesus is the Messiah. Um, ups and downs. Then um, Jesus predicts his death and turns around and, and rebukes Peter. We have the transfiguration. Jesus healing a demon-possessed boy, um, predicting his death again. Um, so we have a sending out, Jesus sending out the disciples, some ups and lots of ups and downs. And, um, and then, in chapter 10, the Lord now chose 72 other disciples and sent them ahead of him and sent them on ahead in pairs to all the towns and villages he planned to visit. These were, these were his instructions to them. The harvest is so great, but the workers are so few. Pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest and ask, ask him to send out more workers for his fields. Go now and remember that I am sending you out as lambs among wolves. Don't take any money or a traveler's bag or even an extra pair of sandals and don't stop to greet anyone on the road. This is an incredible passage. These two are. Um, some people that I work with say that these passages and their corresponding passages in the other Gospels are the only real explained method for planting a church or actually doing evangelism and making disciples. There are many other examples in the Bible, but this is where it's actually explained, one of the only places where it's actually explained. So where is discipleship in this, Patrick? Um, What's in... What's important here that we need to focus on this morning? Well, I want to focus on the prayer that, that uh, was part of the instructions that Jesus gave to the 72. This is after Jesus sent out the 12 to go to towns and villages. 
And they went out and shared the word. And then we had lots of people come and be interested in Jesus. And now there are 72. So some would say, well, 12 times 5 is 60. Plus 12 is 72. So possibly, just a thought, if each disciple were to have gotten five people from the towns and villages, adding on the the 12 on top of each five that they got would be a total of 72. Simply a thought. What's not simply a thought is this prayer request that Jesus asked them to pray. Pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest and ask him to send out more workers for his fields. And now that's an important prayer. And I think it's important because where it is in this passage. It's in the instructions of when they're going out to new towns and villages where Jesus is about to go. I don't think it's too much of a stretch to say, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers from these places where I'm about to, where we're about to go, where you're about to go and I'm about to go. And that is the beginning of discipleship. Jesus is discipling the disciples, obviously, sending out the 72, and their prayer from the beginning is, Lord, raise up people that you can send out as disciples. From these people that are not reached yet, send out workers. The vision for people going out who haven't been raised up yet is being set here. That's the prayer. That's the prayer of extreme walk. That's the prayer of discipleship. Lord, of the people that don't even know you yet, send out workers from those people. Send out workers into the harvest. Even more in this passage, um, it's geared toward focusing, not on going from house to house, but focusing on one person in a town or a village. Investing in them. Coming with need so that they can supply the needs of the worker. So that the work can be based from one place. So Rachel and I have the awesome privilege of being able to send out workers to do just this. To pray and ask the Lord to send out workers from people that don't even know the Lord yet. The vision of discipleship is this, that we would send people not to teach, but to learn in a cross-cultural setting at the same time that they're making disciples. And it even gets bigger than that. I don't want you to think that this is an American thing. I thought it was. I thought, okay, Lord, what's the biggest I could think? What's, what's, the, what's the biggest vision I could come up with? And the biggest thing I could think of was for the Lord to use this, to use us, to start churches planting churches in every region of the world. And I thought, Lord, send me some people to send. Send send me some people to send out so I can send them to all these different countries that I have in each region of the world. But not too many came. I got three from America last year. I thought, Lord, what's going on? Are we just kind of fading here? And the Lord said, wait. And I was surprised by eight applications from Colombians to go out as missionaries with this program. I thought I was going to have a, an informational meeting to tell them more about the opportunities that possibly we could have some international applicants to also go out as missionaries to other countries. And I received applications. I'm about to, um, to show you a video of, of, a, of what the program is and hopefully that will that will capture a bit more of the vision for discipleship. So as you watch it, 
um, pay attention to the vision for making disciples, for disciples making disciples as you watch it. See if you can identify any of the key factors um, such as that. That was about 40 minutes. Yeah, no problem.
what I've been doing with the guitar is, is teaching um, the kids, and then in return, they can teach, so that when I leave, the program doesn't drop at all. But we have, we have teachers, and we have uh, leaders uh, in the music group. Our, our goal here is that we have these 10 months, and uh, once we leave, um, then that's it. So if we bring all of the, all of the work onto ourselves, then when we leave, that certain ministry is just going to drop totally. Este es un ministerio muy especial de Joshua, trabajando con los jóvenes de, de Cito, de toda esta ciudad de él. Es un ministerio que lo hace muy bien, tiene muchos amigos, realmente es una gran ayuda, una gran bendición aquí en, en este lugar. Hi, my name is Hayden Bosque, I'm from Hamilton Museum.
as y'all can see, this is much, much bigger than anything that, uh, much, much bigger than anything that we are. The Lord is rocking our worlds with with what He's doing in different countries. What you saw from this video was fruit from the Lord raising up a team, helping Patrick. This was from the team that he rose up the second year that he was in Ecuador. So this is just from one country uh, that you see. And we've had teams in Angola and Mexico. And um, we're setting up things from Mozambique and the Philippines. And we've got a girl in Kazakhstan right now, one back in Ecuador, and one trying to get to Brazil. Um, so it's continuing to expand in unbelievable ways. And that has been our prayer and vision as we were on our faces before the Lord over a year ago um, saying, Lord, what do you want to do with us? What do you want to do with this? Because it's so much more than a program. It's people's lives for eternity. And so part of the doors that he's opening up and, and, and the dreams that he's placing in us is to be able to have different training centers within the South American regions, within the Africa, Asia, Middle East, Europe, so that different people who normally would never have the opportunity, nationals, can be trained, equipped, and sent out within their country and to other countries. And part of, Patrick mentioned a little bit earlier, the group that we were with in Colombia, we were just down there um, about three weeks ago with a group of eight Colombians that the Lord raised up, because Patrick came down to propose, and the secretary uh, uh, one of the main denominations down there called and said, you know, can we have a meeting? Well, the Lord has much greater plans than we did because here she came over to share her heart and she had eight applicants right there that she laid on the table. And so he had gone before us and opened up those doors. And the time that we had with them was just incredible. It was a huge span from an 18-year-old, 19-year-old, and he's right in between, almost 19, to mid mid forties and uh nineteen year old better not have to do it. He had left his family four years ago, has been on his own and comes from a broken family. Part of the reason why he isn't with them is because they have rejected him because he has taken up the Lord. And they don't want anything to have to do with that strong Catholic background. And so as he had tears streaming down on his face, streaming down his face and, and weeping for his family who has rejected him and weeping for the lost who don't know the love of Jesus and weeping because of the great goodness that he has in the Jesus person Savior. Our lives have been enriched so much by walking with people like Jeanette who's another Colombian woman who 12 years ago had her life radically She's been on the street. She's been in jail. She was a prostitute. She's been in drugs. Just the whole gamut. And the Lord has radically changed her life. And she's in process to be sent to Spain. And so the Lord is rising up different people from the nations to be sent out to the nations. And it just stirs our heart and lights us on fire what he's doing. And that we have the highest privilege to be a part of this. And and so it's just, it's a humbling process, and it's been, it's been so neat for me over the last, last, uh, let's see, probably the last month that the Lord has, has really touched my heart. I don't know what he's doing, because before, you know, I was, I was involved with prison ministry and sports ministry in Medellin, Colombia. And, and that was my life. I loved it. And the door, doors might be open for me to get to go back there. I was there for a little over a year before the Lord opened up doors to get married and, and just all types, of, all types of wonderful things. And so it's been just an incredible process for the Lord to open my heart for what he has and to just break my heart again for the loss and the great and high privilege that we have to know him personally and to carry that message and to equip and to train and so it has been just incredible to see what the Lord has done in 
such powerful ways in the lives of, of these people and to work alongside the nationals of these countries. And that's what is so cool about extreme walk because it turns our world upside down. And it's not about, you know, doing things the Western way. It sends out people from the nations to learn from the nationals within those nations. And so it's always in partnership. And the Lord's always the center of that. So um, thanks for hanging in there with me. Um, Patrick's going to share one last thing, and then I'll close this up. I guess I just wanted to take a moment um, in this time and and thank you as a body for being that family for me in such an important time in my life when I was um, not necessarily floating, but when I was in a a point of of firming up that needed to happen. It was a very formative time for me, but not just formative. I was going from a bit of a letdown in a new responsibility with coordinating Extreme Walk and not receiving too many people to go out again with Extreme Walk. Very, very few, and wondering what the Lord was doing and if I was in the right place and if I needed to pass the torch on to somebody else and move on to whatever the next thing was. So during that time of wondering, during that time of of looking for the vision of where it was going, it was wonderful to be here among you, among this community that focused me on the Lord, that focused me um, on the Word, that gave me the uh, the context to continue to remain strong, um, both in my um, in pursuing Rachel and in. Um, and in following the Lord on the way of extreme walk. So it, it's really nothing big, what, what I want to share now. Um, it's really just a small analogy that, that uh, John Reinheimer encouraged me with. Um, him and his, uh, his wife, Erica, are headed out on Saturday to go to Africa for two years. I was sharing with him and you know, may the Lord use my words because it, it's not really anything big, it's very small. Um, I was sharing with him about an incredible experience on my honeymoon that I got to try surfing. And I had this really big longboard that was much bigger than me. They really just rode the waves well. I, all I had to do was stand up. It, it was very, very easy. Much easier than it would be with, with a smaller board. Much easier than it would be if the waves had been different. And I was sharing with, with John how I felt, you know, just very in transition. And I was wondering if I was, you know, doing my job and doing things the right way and if I needed to be on top of things more. And he was just like, hey, man, just ride your longboard on the way that the Lord's got you on. And I guess that's what I want to share with you as well. As a body, as a seminary, as individuals, the Lord's bringing waves and change and ups and downs but we have a long board and that's who we are in Christ together in Christ and that will carry you all you have to do is stand up um, just as we we close today um So I was praying last night and thinking about different things. Um, We have a great invitation. An invitation that came from Jesus when he invited each one of us to have a personal relationship with him. A great invitation that came as he invited the disciples to walk beside him, to learn from him. A great invitation that came as he opened his arms and invited the children to come hop in his lap. A great invitation that came even while he was still on the cross. A great invitation that still extended to us every single day. And I have to ask myself, what type of an invitation do I have for other people to invite them to our King? 
to invite them to our Savior, to invite them to our Lord. What's the countenance like on my face? What's the tone of my voice? What are my actions? What's my attitude? What type of invitation do I give to my family and how I serve them? What type of invitation do I give with the body of Christ where sometimes, so many times, it's the hardest to give love of the Lord? What type of invitation do we have today? Because invitation is always ours. Always ours to receive and the invitation is always ours to give to the world who desperately needs the Lord. And so I encourage you today to, you know, some some of y'all are just crawling through the valley trying to make it to a nice class and some of y'all are on the mountaintop seeing all types of incredible things. We all get to see incredible things. I just want to encourage you today at whatever stage you're at, you know, some of us, another chapel to get through, you know, what's it going to be today and others are, so whatever stage you're at, receive an invitation from our Lord and also give that invitation to every single person that the Lord places before you and uh, it's it's a great privilege and an honor to be with you, with, with each one of y'all today look forward to getting to uh, meet meet you some more and uh, reconnect with those of you who we know. But um, let's just take five minutes and, and sit before the Lord and receive that invitation to, to run into Papa's arms and, and to let him restore and renew and to strengthen and refine. Um, let's just take the next few minutes to just sit with our Savior and to, and to bring what we have to to the foot of the cross and then um, we'll just close with prayer. Sweet and precious Lord, today we we come before you humbly and broken and absolutely desperate, in need of you and in need of your touch and in need of your arms to wrap around us. We are in desperate need for you to, to place us in the fire. Lord Jesus, we We long to know you more. Jesus, I pray for for my brothers and sisters here that you would you would hide them under your wings. You would place them in the cleft of the rock. And that you would build them up and that you would provide every resource that they need in this time of preparation. In this time of studying. In this time of of being your body every single day of their lives. Will you, will you renew their strength? Will you give them your mind? Will you give them your heart for your people, Lord Jesus? Holy Spirit, help to help to infiltrate every single class, everything, every single chapel, every single family. Lord, I pray a hedge of protection around each and every person here. I pray your blessing upon them. And I pray that you would continue to rise up and raise up mighty, mighty warriors to fight in the battle for you every single day. So we praise you and we thank you 
for the opportunities that you give us to grow in you. And the great and, and incredible folks that you place in our lives to encourage us and to grow us and to sharpen us. Lord, will you continue to be the center of Wesley Biblical? Will you be the center of each and every person here? come before you as your children and I would pray that you would help us. We we'll give you the rest of the day and we lay ourselves before you. I pray that you would give us the strength to be obedient to what you've called us to do. So Lord, go with each and every person here in a mighty and a powerful way as they live today for you. In the sweet and precious name of Jesus, I pray.